this is um, Disability Cornwall podcast station. Um, this is podcast number two. I'm Theo Blackmore again, the host of this meeting, and I'd like to introduce my esteemed guest. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dean Harvey. Do you know what I do? You certainly do. Uh, so I am a community development worker for uh, minoritised communities, um, what used to be described as main black asian minority ethnic communities uh, for mental health and emotional well-being and i'm lucky enough to sit on the board of our local nhs trust and so you work who do you work for i work for so i'm based at pantry a mental health charity uh, here in cornwall it's a sort of shared contract, NHS uh, type contract, outsourced uh, contract. I'm very lucky. And then the NHS board is the NHS and myself. Marvellous. Um, and I work, which I didn't say before, I work for Disability Cornwall and the Isles of Silly. Um, and so this is a Disability Cornwall podcast series. So today, um, I've invited Dean uh, particularly to talk, to talk about one of his areas of expertise, and that area is the field of intersectionality, which is a great big scary word, and it's a word that we hear more and more. In fact, I just saw a graph on the internet, and it said the use of the word, and it was just all completely level going along and it going along, and then you get to about, I don't know, the sort of the mid 2010s, and it goes up through the roof, and suddenly everybody starts talking about it intersectionality and it almost seems to be a bit the word of the moment so I think the best place to start really is to try to understand what that word means um what's your understanding of that that so term? my understanding of it so my understanding of it originally coined by Kimberly Crenshaw uh worth looking at worth googling and I, I think I look at it in forms of oppression uh, which I'm sure that we'll get onto, and and it's the intersection between multiple an intersection. The intersectionality came from the intersection in a road, you know, American term for like a crossroads, so where things intersect. And it was looking at multiple uh, oppressions on identities. So it was looking at um, uh, race and gender. Uh, and um, sexuality and so on so and I was looking at there's some quite sort of stuck they're not clumsy but just to help us think um, examples of you know if someone is a black lesbian with a disability facing the world accessing services and so on in the different systems that we live that they most likely face multiple oppressions and dealing with one at a time does not actually solve the problem for a lot of people it doesn't lead to equity at all it often leads to services thinking that they're dealing with something but actually missing out a whole part of the person that they face so i'm, I'm saying this without reading notes really because i don't, I don't want to re read notes but I, I I understand that. I understand that where services, you know, look at things like maybe the gender pay gap and then don't take into consideration uh, racial equity in that or um, disability in that. And just have this linear approach or if we fix this because this person is female, because this person is male, that would have been sorted. They don't face any other discrimination. They don't face any other discrimination. And I, I, I see that as quite, um, I can see how institutions get to that way of thinking, the same way that they think about equality. If we don't do something for everyone, we can't do anything for anyone sort of type of approach. And that this must solve problems, but none of us are linear. That's, that's the point. When I'm thinking about intersectionality, it's always about oppression and discrimination and stuff. It's already recognizing that we have different aspects to identity. Some we have more choice or input into than others, but it's about the systems that we, we face. 
Yeah, I mean, big institutions, like you say, they deal with a, an issue at a time almost, and it's kind of comes down from a very top down view, sort of the world in many ways. So the government has an understanding, right, we've got to deal with racism, so let's deal with that, spit spot. So let's ignore all the other stuff and just deal with that one thing. And then it's disabledism, and so let's deal with that, spit spot. And I remember you, you and I met up years ago. That was something, when was that? 2012, maybe, or 13. And you had a, the great idea of setting up a disability or a hate crime network in Cornwall, where third sector organisations became safe spaces for people to go to and to be able to report incidents of hate crime that they'd experienced. And that, so for example, a disability corner would became a hate crime recording centre on the basis that anybody could then come in. So if obviously our name is Disability Call, but if somebody came in on the basis of discrimination for race or sexism or homophobia or whatever it might be, they could come into our safe space and use our safe space. No, I agree, and I, I think it has. The, I think there's intersectionality in one. I, I think it's almost as a. So take myself. I would just use myself for an example, and about hidden disabilities, and stuff. So, you know that maybe the effects of a hate crime uh, around race maybe has an effect. But then I think about the effects that it might have on a disability and where do I go? Why should I have to choose which hate crime support and report centre that I, I go to? And how can I be seen in whichever one that I go to in, in completely? And I, I think that's some of the point. I think we've got a long way to go, to be quite honest, about rolling up our sleeves, doing the work and maintaining, I, I think all of the reporting, support and report for me was the most important aspect of that, that you get support wherever you go. But I think the thing that would tie everybody together is just like a rights-based approach. Yeah. yeah, and it's a long way off still, you know. I remember that we had, a, we had a conference about intersectionality recently, and we were talking then about how we met up all those years ago and we started putting blocks in place and we started building the foundations of what we thought would be this great thing. And then we're being called on now by lots of authorities to go and do that work again, because a lot of it, you know, staff move, staff change over. And, and it seems like a lot of that knowledge gets lost. I know I was reading recently that the county council has to make something ridiculous like 80 million pounds of cuts. And so a lot of people are taking early retirement and what that does is that reduces a lot of the cultural knowledge of that organisation and how it works and what it's got embedded in it. And so then the new people coming through think, hang on a minute, there isn't anything about that. Let's start that again. And so we're treading on the wheel again. Uh, I, I agree. I mean, I mean, there's some ways with systems that it's a constant uh, kick it into the long grass activity by renaming stuff and constantly doing stuff. So it starts here and... For me, there was I had a bit of that experience through the Black Lives Matter um, uh, protests and experience, and and how could I not be supportive? Apart from the 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 sort of statements of it starts here, and and whenever you think it starts here, you're forgetting everybody in the past, everybody that fought for your rights, all of that that knowledge, and I, I like that sort of Sankova approach the african approach where you know you do look back but you look back for what's useful you don't dwell in the past but you look back for what's useful and you put it into your path for the future it's it's really important but i think our knowledge base and our networks through examples of what you gave theo it's that it depletes our knowledge base and and in the third sector we're a very fragile collection of uh, organisations, small organisations, and I think we have to work really hard together to keep some basic principles flowing through. It's, it's not always a, a well-received uh, fact that most discrimination is faced in the third sector because there isn't an ombudsman or collective. So you can go to different agencies and they're going to have different levels of training, 
and so on. So it's not like a franchise model that, you know, you go into a McDonald's anywhere and you expect McDonald's to be McDonald's, a terrible example. But, but if you go to the third sector, I think for things like your rights, for access and stuff, I don't think it is a franchise approach. That's amazing. I didn't know that. It was so third sector is is guilty of, of, of great discrimination. Collectively, that yeah. is. And there are lots of reports, and I, I will I will send you some of the reports afterwards. I don't want a conversation to be, but when you think about that, especially in rural areas, how else can it be? So uh, an example: if if a small organisation that has found funding to provide a service a small service, I can't think of a service, but a small service, but they do not have um, an interpreter budget. Yeah. Then that service, not because they've got a sign on the door saying no, that service is then not accessible to all people. And you have almost no right to address, redress on that. And uh, living in an area like ours, where we're relying more and more on the third sector, I think that is everywhere, the voluntary sector, third sector, that's going to be a problem for many of us, which is going to be an example of intersectionality in action. Yeah, I mean, the key word there is in action. It's, um, you know, I've, I talk about the third, I talk about disabled people's organizations as a separate sector almost within the third sector within the voluntary sector because I think we have our own challenges specific to ourselves as organizations and one of those specific challenges is that we need in every single budget to include budgets for accessibility and those in other organizations that's often overlooked and sometimes in our own organizations that's overlooked you know and so we provide a service, whatever that service might be, but there needs to be stuff in there for British Sign Language, for interpretation across the bottom of the screen, for all sorts of different access formats, as it were, so that different people can come to the service and have it equal. I agree, and I, and I think we all struggle. And, and the, the, I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I work in the third sector and I love it. It is people helping people. But we have to look at things like different models, economies of scale. You know, it would be better in some ways, which is what I'm pushing for at the moment, to have a county-wide interpreting budget and your bigger institutions putting in more so that the smaller organisations can tap into it when they need it. Things like language line, they can tap into it when they need it. That would instantly remove a barrier to people and I, and I think before when we when we all used to meet uh, I, I, I understand totally what you're saying around the disability sector I think there is probably a weakness there or a potential fragility if we just look at our own sector and not see the knock-on effects to others because as we know that one sector holds an amazing amount of knowledge the other areas of the third sector might not have, which means if we don't share some knowledge, it means because as a disabled person, as a black person, as a gay person, to be quite honest, I should be able to access any service as, you know, I, I shouldn't have to only go to disability services. I shouldn't only have to go to racially aware services. I should be able to access any of those services at all. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the whole intersectionality thing, isn't it? It's yeah. like we are not a series of component parts. We are an individual. We are a whole. I know certainly that Disability Call, well, if somebody phones up the disability information and advice line, then that call will be received. And that call is kind of a route into somebody's life. And so they call up with an initial inquiry. But then there's a whole process of trying to unpack a holistic vision of that individual to try to meet all of their needs. And so I remember talking to somebody who set up a CAB service in the east of the county and that they, they, no, he's no longer there, I don't think, but he said the most common inquiry they get at the CAB is how can I go on holiday? And that leads you through a door, which is like, well, A, why do you need to go on holiday? Why can't you afford to go on holiday? 
what you tried to holiday away from and all of those sorts of issues and that unpacks a whole big package of stuff which then that individual were never even thought of so it's about being holistic about about the whole process i think about uh, I, I think so and then i think if you're looking at access so if, if you have mobility needs and, and other needs around your ability or your disability i think that one of how can i go on holiday is a really good question uh, access and stuff but what if you're the same person you're black and you're gay does that limit the amount of places that you can go on holiday to how you're going to be treated how you can express yourself that sort of stuff and, and i think it's i think it's that recognizing that people are under those levels of stress from having to even think that way man and i don't think we should avoid that many people go through that and i think we have to look at our own services you know i i i look i know that i am always going to be treated fairly at the organization not because i'm here doing the podcast because i know people that work in the organization but one of my thoughts would be is the color of my skin going to make a difference are there going to be other people that look like me is, is this going to be understood am i going to be able to talk about my vulnerabilities when i'm out and about as in color of my skin and my disability and it's it's those conversations and they they feel quite difficult but i don't think they are difficult because the more we have those conversations the easier it is to see each other um something you said a long time ago before when you started talking about 10 minutes ago was interesting and it was a comment when you said that you work with minoritized communities, you said, who were previously known as BAME communities. Something that I find quite difficult in, in this subject area is the language is very clunky and, I, and it changes and it's, it's about terminology. And I remember once we had a conversation and you said that, I remember that you described yourself, you said, you said something, a set of terminology and you said, I'm just being lazy using that. And I think that's interesting, that idea that the terminology is, something that we all need to be aware of. I know that, for example, the LGBTQIA plus community often has problems, not has problems, but, you know, the way that the way that we as the ex other, other community use pronouns is problematic for for that community um, because we often get them wrong and we get the language wrong and the language is very clunky and I'm being very clunky now in the way that I'm voicing that, which is kind of part of the problem, I think, part of the process. I, I, I think the BAME, the BAME, for me, my, for me to understand it, I think it very much was a metric. So it was data. To, so when you've got small groups of people uh, in your area, small groups of people in your area, and maybe they uh, experience some of the same trials and tribulations, then to bring everybody together under one uh, banner, as in as a metric, so that you can then sort of uh, make sure that it has a, enough weight to sort of show up on any data to look to provide services. The trouble for me comes from when the metric then turns into being a descriptor, goes into the common language and as a descriptor. So there is no such place as BAME. There is no BAME land. For us, our service, it's, it's in our service description, in, in our contract but it simply means in our contract our definition is is anybody that's not white british or white cornish and so you can imagine that goes from roma gypsy community ukrainian communities nigerian communities it goes right across the board now lots of those communities have why would they they're different cultures have nothing in common apart from being minoritized that process of minoritizing, that process of being called by services hard to reach, that it's a very small number. This is all unwitting, I think. And there's not so many card carrying races around anymore. But it's always then, it's a small amount. We will get round to that eventually. We'll just deal with the majority first. 
it, it doesn't work. And so those communities are minoritized. They aren't minorities. I, I don't come from a minority community. In fact, you know, globally, I'm in the majority. It doesn't help in the country that I live in, but globally, I'm in the majority. But it's that way of doing stuff. And so you've gone from a metric to describing people as BAME, and then it, has, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything at all. It's absolutely pointless. And all of the stigma and, and stuff and unwitting prejudice and oppression goes with this mythical group that doesn't actually exist. So now we are then designing services for this whole group, like a BAME tribe. How is, how is that going to work? And I, I know at one time there was the same stuff around disability. It was, so we've had these conversations in all of the areas. It is really important how people describe themselves, of course. So describing is really important, but I don't want to do away with the metric because the metric and data is really important. And again, the difficulty is if we keep changing names, we can't keep using the same data. And we sort of, each time we lose our history. Yeah, you know, and as organisations, I think we use those metrics because we need to record the numbers of people coming into our organisations and using our services. And like you say, the funders yeah. need that kind of information and data. But the terms essentially, you know, BAME is a term on a shelf box file, LGBTQIA plus box file, disability box file. And it's, but once you open each box file, there's a massive diversity within that. Yeah, without a doubt. And, and, I, and I think it leads to uh, lazy thinking, not on purpose. I, I, I very rarely meet someone who's not hardworking, but I think it, it it leads to that and how to provide services. That's why I think the right space, you know, you have to have intersecting uh, principles to deliver services. So the rights based, you can't go far wrong. You know, I, I like the, living in Cornwall, I like the idea of civic Cornwall. If you live here, however long, you are a citizen. You might be a new Cornish citizen, but you are a citizen. That instantly shows that you all have rights and responsibilities. So some of these things would be overlapping and it's important to move forward. What I do find with institutions and stuff, I mean, those type of the black part in black Asian minority is really important to remember for the black community and Asian is the one. Well, that is just absolutely huge. What does what does that mean? But minoritized and marginalized that can be applied to all of us. You know how you can be minoritized or marginalized because of your diagnosis or your disability or your gender or the color of your skin. Institutions need to work with those processes because we know that the systemic and the structures do not work for everyone. In fact, they actively discriminate against some groups either through access through this, or we don't see many of you around here, or, or we've never had this issue before here. It leads to really lazy thinking, and lazy thinking is just harmful for, you know, our institutions are us. It's not us versus them. They are us. They just don't work for all of us. Yeah. You know, and it's very interesting. So the third sector, we talked about it a little bit, um, and, you know, I agree with you completely. I think it's a very kind of, the, the people who work in the third sector are very together, they're hardworking, they're very sound of mind, and they really want to be as open and welcoming as possible for as many people as possible. That's always been my big issue. So when I did this mapping exercise and mapping disabled people's organisations across the country, there's a real minority of organisations that represent minority groups of disabled people. So, you know, I only found one organization that works specifically with LGBTQIA plus or disabled people, that organization is in London. So if you're from that minority and you're a disabled person, where do you go for assistance? Where do you go to your local disabled people's organization? Something you said just then was, you know, if you go into one of those organizations, will there be people who look like me? And I think that's a key issue in the whole intersectionality debate is to make sure that there are people employed there who look like all of us and who are all of us because we are all we all need to be represented what other sorts of things do you think 
organisations can do to make themselves welcoming to anybody who walks through the doors, really? Well, I mean, if, if I stick just to Cornwall, the examples, rural area, lots of third, third sector services, voluntary services and stuff, you know, I am not saying, and I know that you know I'm not saying, I'm not clumsy enough to go, look, you need one of each, and therefore just so, just having that representation, that doesn't always work. But there are things that we can do. I mean, all of our equality strategies and stuff should look exactly the same, shouldn't they? That whole, they, sh they should look the same. They should have the same foundations and stuff. They would all be bespoke for different organisations because they deliver different services. But we haven't even got that far. The funding that is, if, if anybody who's worked in the third sector for long enough knows that the funding model, you are often uh, made to compete against each other. That, that's not a great, that's not a great environment. So you compete together. And, and a lot of the funders have a lot to do here. The, a lot of the funding bids include access, EDI, equality, diversity, inclusion. They include all of that. And it becomes like a tick box exercise for small organizations going with. So that means there are lots of organizations taking money in your name, Theo, and taking money in my name. But we never even get to hear of those services. And there's nobody checking, checking and helping. You know, I don't, I don't want to hold small organizations going, no, we're taking your money away because you're terrible at this thing. But if you know you're not great at something as a small organization, you should be able to go somewhere to improve that. So we're going to have to have a shared approach. And I think the, dis the discrimination that I see in the third sector is we haven't really even got a collective ombudsman. There's nowhere to take your complaints. If I go to one organization, it's this complaint mechanism. If I go to another, it's this complaint mechanism. And as we know, living in a rural area, one of the oppressions that you face is the stigma or the um, the words that go with it, like this person, oh, this person's trouble. They do this, they do that. I think anyone who lives in a rural area knows that sort of stuff. So the troubles are then pushed back on to you. I, I, I often see that we were talking in our conversation beforehand about public transport and I catch public transport everywhere. It's, it's how I get around and I, I, I very much like the fact. But I often see people with disabilities um, trying to get on the bus, for instance, and some buses are good, some buses are not. But if there are difficulties getting on the bus, so access, it's almost like the difficulties are then the fault of the person having the difficulties get on, not the shape of the bus, not the fact that it can't lower or, and there's some of that that goes on. So unless we work together and have these conversations, you know, any of us should be able to go in anywhere and have the same service. That's what we should be aiming for. Eventually, we should be able to do away with specialist services and have services that are repositories of knowledge that you, anybody that is starting a service can go and get best practice, best knowledge, understand how stuff works. And I'm not sure that that's where we are. You know, it's, it's I think if you have any one of those, you know, what they're called protected characteristics, if you have any one of those protected characteristics, then you spend a lot of your life feeling like a square peg trying to get into a round hole and the round hole often is something like a bus or a building or you know come to this place if you want to do this thing you can't even get in there you know it's that kind of thing the old there was the old cartoon wasn't there of the disabled person's toilets with the flight of steps to get up to it and somebody in a wheelchair at the bottom of that flight of stairs just thinking hang on a minute it's um it's obvious but it's it's difficult and in fact i do know places that still have toilets upstairs disabled toilets upstairs or toilets for disabled people upstairs but that whole thing about intersectionality um, and all the isms you know racism and disabledism you know it's an interesting subtopic here how come how come most of the um, protected characteristics all have isms except for lgbtqia and they get a phobia so you know the, the language that we use is very kind of I think that, yeah, I think the, the languages, but the effects are the same. Sorry? The languages, but the effects are the same. And I, and I think 
services need to focus on that more. I mean, you know, my, my only concern isn't around racism or ableism or any of the things that, that uh, are in my life. They are around everything, and I understand that. And it's also looking at the effects. So for me, LGBTQ and um, being Black, those two, those two things. I work in a mental health service, and when you look at the mental health statistics and the stats and the trouble, they are comparable. They are, they are terrible. So now I can almost, just from my thinking, it's, okay, let's just take the Black out the way and the LGBT out the way and look at what do these two communities have in common. And that's when you start seeing the thing about because it's not. So if I was a gay man, being gay isn't a mental health problem. Uh, I'm a black man. Being black isn't a mental health problem. It is being black or being gay, navigating yourself through life and through the systems that causes the stresses and stuff. So now we can then look at, OK, how can we reduce those stresses? We know some of the big ones, stigma, all of those things. But without having those open conversations, we've still got a long way to go. There always will be a long way to go, but that shouldn't stop us making actions. And actually, so you have the, the rights-based approach would be you've got the rights to information and easy accessible information. And when I say accessible in the way that you as an individual can understand that information, not hidden away in some academic report these sort of things. When we start seeing our commonalities, I'm, I'm sort of lucky really, I grew up in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Uh, I grew up in Brighton and when, you know, when the National Front used to march down the main street from the station down to the main street in Brighton, you know, I would be stood next to um, uh, a gay man protesting the same things because we saw the common interest. We saw the common interest, this is what we want. And I think that's where we need to see the common interests that are overlapping. But we are so all busy protecting our identities because of the multiple oppressions that we don't see the ties that bind us. Never a colorblind approach, that would be ridiculous. But there are some ties that bind us that we need to fight together. Yeah, that's really interesting. So I had a conversation or an email conversation with you because this whole thing about intersectionality for me appears to be something which is an incredible strength because it brings together various identities into one identity or into one whole, as it were, not various identities, but various different bits of identity into one whole. And so in theory, because I'm a disabled guy, you know, if I'm a disabled black gay person, then that's three different identities that are all together into one. And so it's kind of like we should be celebrating that kind of wholeness and holistically, whereas the reality is somewhat different. We often get separated out, like we said at the beginning, to our separate component parts. So I remember talking to somebody who was a wheelchair user and he was a gay man. And he said he just never felt that he fitted anywhere. If he went into the disability world as a gay person, he never really felt he fitted there. And if he went into the gay world as a disabled person, he never fitted there. And so it often seems to pull people apart and pull communities apart rather than bringing them together. You're not you should well, be uniting I, rather than dividing. I, I think so. I mean, I mean, there's always the need to unite, and there always will be. And I, but I think it's it's more than identity, though. I, I think you know that whole identity thing, which seems to be much more so multiple identities, as we're saying them here. But for me, that intersectionality and the work that I do is about the multiple oppressions or the multiple discriminations. That's where that goes. And that's some of the stuff that can bring us together. So, you know, if we're talking about access, if we're talking about safer streets, what I see at the moment is the, the people in my community, the sit of my fellow citizens are my sisters fighting for safer streets. But when I talk, when I'm delivering training around racism and I'm talking to women, and, and if you live in a rural area, I live in a majority area, so I talk to a lot of white women. And at one time, it feels like that we can't see each other. I'm trying to say what it's like to be this, and this person is saying, but I can't walk a mile in your shoes, I can't see this stuff. When we talk about fear at night, 
and not feeling safe in our streets, they all of a sudden we've got a shared course. We can see each other, and it's small, but we can see each other. So there's the building block because it turns out that the, the women I think are not going to understand my life. This, I'm using really clumsy examples. One part of our life where we can no longer be ourselves is when we're out at night in the street. All of a sudden, all of the all of the stigmas, all of the fears, all of the dangers are very, very real. And then you really do have to start thinking about being female, about being disabled, about being black. So there is a joint piece of work. If we make the streets safer for one group, we actually make streets safer for everybody. That's I do not feel safe. This is not at night in main towns on a Friday night, on a Saturday night. I do. So that does not then mean I know what it's like to be female. I don't. I can learn, but I don't. That's not my lived experience. But I do know about those fear on the streets. So now if I start talking to LGBT friends, if I start talking to my friends around disability, if we have that shared experience, then there's our work. Proactively, we can do something. Yeah, my yeah. identity is pretty fluid anyway. Do you know what I mean? And, and shaped by the systems that we live in. But I want to be at all times proactive because it's it's empowering. Yeah, the streets at night, they don't feel safe to me as somebody who uses wheels, somebody on a scooter. <laughs> And, you know, I've often come into contact in broad daylight with people who are drunk, who are laughing at me on my scooter and want to push me out so they can have a, so they can have a go. You know, that looks fun. Give me a go on that. Oh, Greg, thank you. You know, it's, it can be very frightening. Out I, 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 I agree. And again, you know, I, I, I don't know what it's like to be you and I don't know what it's like to be in, but now I, I, sort of see I identify with you do you know what I mean that's I just do and if we open up conversations like this there are so many of us that are frightened to use our own streets at certain places in certain times through lived experience this isn't oh I'm just frightened through lived experience then all of a sudden we have got that unifying thing that we can do something about that is going to make life better for everyone because I think there are a lot of people Whatever I say is going to be clumsy here. You know, I think there are a lot of older people that feel the same. I think there are a lot of, and all of a sudden we all start seeing each other. We haven't got our, each other's lived experience, but that one experience, it suddenly starts turning out that we're a much bigger group than we thought we were, and we are being terrorised by the behaviour of a few, and that's the whole idea of turning this whole. You see, I've, I've been interested in this for quite a while, but in relation to, obviously I'm a man, but in relation to women's issues, because the whole being safe on the streets at night, you know, the whole case with Sarah Everard and the police and the, the, the unsafe situation in which women find themselves in or feel that they are in, um, the majority of the population are women. You know, more than in Corn it's something like 51.4% of the population in Cornwall are women and 48.6% are men. So the majority of the population feels unsafe for in various situations, maybe all the time, in fact, certainly coming across groups of men and certainly when there's alcohol involved. And that's just can't be right. How can that be? How can that how can that be? And if we together, if we should be stronger, but it's not. And at the same time, it's not necessarily for us to change them. It's for them to try to figure out what's going on to kind of change themselves. Uh, yeah, and it, it's for all of us to work together. I mean, I, the whole upstanding bystander thing, I think, is important. I, I need to hear, as a, as a human, I need to hear other people's experiences to get me out of myself. When it's shared experiences, I feel like I understand more, only from my point of view, but I understand more. So that, that empowers us, that's more of empowerment. But it is also, I play a part in that, and it is my job to do something about it. I mean, since the Black Lives Matter stuff, it was all about allies. 
and after Black Lives Matter, both in my workplace and, and, and in my communities and stuff, the amount of allies I suddenly got that I had to sort of, you know, oh, I understand, I got this, I've read this book, have you read this book? It's like, like oh, I don't really need to read a book on that. Who is that wise I, I get that, but it, it just left. I don't want allies. Uh, what I want is fellow citizens. I don't want allies. Allies seems to be sometimes misconstrued as if you're in the majority or if you're in that group, that that is a, a badge of honour that you're an ally and that you're a good person. This isn't being about a good or a bad person. I don't need allies. You know, if you're in a fight, you look to your left and you look to your right and, and it's those are your brothers and sisters. This allies thing, this is, when do you get to do that? So I, I, I've been on male ally training and, and the training was great. It's delivered really well. But I, I don't think I want to be an ally. I want to be a fellow human being. I want to be a brother to sisters. And if there are issues that I can fight for, I'm going to do it. Not because it makes me a better person, but it makes us better as a group. Allies starting to become an industry, and, and the amount of people I had to have discussions with that felt that they had a right to understand my lived experience just by asking me directly, directly, and then fell by the wayside. That's like the armchair warriors that just tick like or something on Facebook and have, have been lowered into the thing of oh, that's making a difference. No, making a difference is getting out there, talking about stuff, doing stuff, not knowing how to do stuff and, and feeling that discomfort, the discomfort of language, the awkwardness of language, instead of sweeping our awkwardness under the carpet, let's face it together, because it turns out you're awkward about some things and I'm awkward about other things. They're probably not the same things. Well, what have we got in common? It feels awkward talking about these things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's work on that. Yeah. And so kind of just one final thing, really, that I just wanted, because we live in a difficult time, the cost of living crisis and financial hardship, and it's getting very cold suddenly and people can't afford to put their heating on. They can't afford to have a hot bowl of soup, all that kind of stuff. In times of economic difficulty, famously, you get big spikes in, in relation to, so disability hate crime, racism, sex, all these different kind of isms go through the roof at this particular point in time is there stuff that you've noticed at the moment is is it the world is i i think it, it never stops for me there's always been that correlation and and what we're, we're calling tough times hate hate incident hate crimes go up with the tough times you know and it always has and it and it makes us all as a community vulnerable i think it makes us this is why we constantly need to be having the awkward conversations conversations that we don't think we have because if we don't have them it makes us vulnerable to fringe voices being able to stir stuff up you know and we can't stop what politicians say and stuff but the whole dog whistle stuff that causes a lot of that stuff Poverty, uh, living in poverty needs to be one of the things around intersectionality anyway, understanding that stuff and, and linking that stuff. So I, I figure that we are vulnerable. I don't think it's as simple as when people are going through, through tough times, they want someone to blame, but at the same time, I think it is that simple. You know, so I know when COVID first started, the uh, hate incidents to anyone that even looked there, anywhere near being Chinese just went up and you could see it was the whole news and that sort of stuff but there was a lot of anger and a lot of stuff over so what do we need to know we need to know how to support people that it is there to be talking about it knowing that it's going up and knowing that reporting isn't everything it's it shouldn't be acceptable again if we empower people to be upstanding bystanders that would help that would help us feel safer and safety should be a basic well it is supposed to be a basic human right that you feel safe yeah safe in your home and safe in your hometown safe in your home community you know yeah. i don't and, you know and when we're saying rights you know we've had this conversation many times it's about rights and responsibility yes you know it's not just about me having that right it's about me being responsible I have to ensure that you have that right. That's 
it's my job as a citizen. It's not something I get paid for. That's my job as a citizen. It's our job as humans who live in this place. It's been an um, absolute pleasure talking to you, Mr. Dean Harvey, Your Excellency. If you, um, brilliant, there's nothing more to say, I don't think, or there's plenty more to say. We could go on for days, you know, it is one of those conversations I don't think will ever end. And I think we'll be back here again, probably in 10 years, having another conversation very similar. Well, uh, there is, I can tell you something about my background, and it's not by accident. I have this background up to remind me. It's about the palm tree. All of the stuff that we're doing is quite difficult. Just to describe that it's, for people with a visual impairment, your background is... Okay, a so my background, beach. in my background, I've got a lovely picture of a lovely sort of white um, coral beach, and I've got a picture of a palm tree behind me. And, and it, what it reminds me of is about resilience and stuff, and the other side of our identities and facing the impressions that we face is about resilience. And the palm tree is it's around the Caribbean that after, you know, hurricanes and stuff, if you look, the things that have survived are in shape are usually things like your palm trees. And it's the whole thing about remember to bend and not break. In order to get through, you have to have that resilience and stuff. So. It just reminds me when I look at that, even when it comes to a difficult conversation or it's, it's challenging me because of my worldview. It's like bend, don't break. You know, soft outside and strong inside is the much better way of doing stuff. Brilliant. Thank you very much for your wise words. Not mine, but you're welcome. <laughs> See you soon. Take care, Dean. Thanks, Theo. Thank you.